Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we're so glad you're joining us for lesson number seven, the unified body of Christ. Actually, that's what the whole book of Ephesians is about, is the unity we find in Christ Jesus. Let me introduce you to the rest of the 3ABN family here. They're not only my family, they're yours. My pastor, John Lomagain. Good to be here, Shelley. I am covering together as one in the one. Amen. Wow. And Ryan Day. All right, I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled The Exalted Christ, Giver of Gifts. Oh, that's a great one. And my sister in Christ, Dr. Yvonne Shelton. Yes, I, I have Wednesday's lesson, and it is Gifts of the Exalted Christ. Oh, we're kind so similar to yeah. yours. <laughs> we're glad you're joining us. And then we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Thursday's lesson, which is growing up in Christ. Well, it's going to be a beautiful study. W James, would you like to have our opening prayer? Sure. Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to grow up in Christ, to find in him the unity of the spirit, of the heart with each other, with your worldwide church. We pray for each of the viewers. Ask that you'll guide and direct their yes. hearts to Jesus that your Holy Spirit will be present with us. We pray these things in His name. Amen. Amen. We are so appreciative of this verse-by-verse -verse study. There's actually 70 lessons from six chapters of Ephesians, and Dr. John McVeigh did such a lovely job in writing this. Our memory text for today is Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. I'll read it to you from the ESV. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. For what purpose? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Ephesians is a book that is just evenly divided into two sections of teaching. Chapters one through three is a theological feast about the inexpressible riches of our blessings in Christ. It gives you your identity in Christ. You understand the fullness of God's plan. Then chapters four through six, Paul gets really practical. It is practical Christianity 101. So this week's study covers only the first half of Ephesians chapter 4, 16 verses that were going to stir us to unity. For, uh, verses 1 through 6 is an impassioned call to unity. Verses 7 through 16, Paul identifies the victorious and exalted Christ as the source of grace who is equipping us to share the gospel. And he describes how the leaders of the church work together with all the church members to contribute to the health and the growth of the body of Christ. You know, Paul frequently used the human body as an analogy for the body of Christ, okay. saying that there were many members of the body, but only one head. And even though we have unique functions in the church, we have only one head. In Romans 12 verses 4 through 5, he says, we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Mm. You're a member of the body, the same body that I'm a member That's of. Right. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, he gives this long list of the various parts of the body, the ear, the foot, the hand, the eye, the senses of hearing and smelling, just to show how necessary each part of the body is to the healthy functioning of the body. But he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have 
the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Right. It's just like a little paper cut makes your, your body suffer, right? And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Right. Now, the, you are the body of Christ and members individually. So he goes on to talk about in 1 Corinthians how all the different functions, the, the various offices of the body, how they all work together to unite the people of God so that his idea of a healthy body is one that helps us understand the goal of God's work in the church. So Sunday is the unity of the spirit. We are going to begin with Ephesians chapter four and verse one. This is an urgent call to unity. And then what Paul does is he lists the virtues that lead us to unity, qualities that actually focus on the benefit of others rather than being overly impressed with self. Let's look at Ephesians 4.1. He's just finished these three chapters of beautiful theological teaching. And then he says, I therefore, that is a transition word. Therefore, based on what we've just covered in chapters one through three, all the things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, this is a call to duty based on the previous explanation. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You see, when we are in Christ, we are in covenant relationship with the Lord. We're in covenant relationship with one another. To walk is referring to our actions. It is how we daily conduct our life. It's an attitude, it's actions of the high and holy calling of being a child mm -hmm. of God. So our daily actions as we are step by step, God is sanctifying us, separating us from sin, bring us into greater unity. We have to look at the Lord Jesus as our source and substance so that we can walk in his righteousness. And I love 80, Psalm 85, 13 hmm. it says, righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps a pathway for us. First John 2, 6 says, anyone who says that he abides in Christ must also walk as he walked. Okay. So Ephesians 4, 2, now Paul's going to start listing the virtues that lead us to unity. So he says, walk worthy. How do you walk worthy of the calling that you have? With all lowliness, with gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. So let's look at those. What is lowliness? Lowliness is humility. I'm gonna give you two definitions for humility, but let's begin with this. Being humble means to be appreciative of the value of others, to serve others. Jesus came as the servant of God. And by his example, he showed us that a life of self-sacrificing love is the root of all humility. And it is the one characteristic we need to develop more than any other one because it is the root of his righteousness. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, Paul says, hey, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient. You know, Jesus didn't obey God to become the Son of God. He obeyed God because he was the Son of God. So the Bible also, if we look at Ephesians 2, 5 through 8, describes humility. To me, the definition is that we learn to depend 100% on God. Did you know there's nothing you can do to merit salvation? 
I don't mm -hmm. care what your diet is like. I don't care how you dress. I don't care how much you give in tithes and offerings. I don't care what you do. As far as obedience, the Pharisees were the strict, mm -hmm. it strictly adhered mm -hmm. to that. None of that saves us, only by the blood of Christ, by the sacrifice of Christ. We, we've got to be, as Jesus said, lest ye be converted and become as little children. You will not enter the kingdom of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. So God wants us to put aside pride. You know, it was self-exaltation and not depending on the Lord that got Lucifer. It swelled up in his heart, this pride that was the root of all sin. Okay, so that is the lowliness. Let's look at gentleness or meekness. Actually, meekness is a product of humility. It means to be mild in spirit and self-controlled. It means you're not going off in temper tantrums and fits of rage. Long suffering is the third one. That's to be patient. Mm. And do you realize we've got humility, which grows into gentleness. Gentleness actually develops patience because we become slow to anger. So then he says, let me repeat it, Ephesians 4, 2, with all lowliness or humility, gentleness or meekness, long suffering, that's patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, read it backwards and you'll see how it all comes together. It is love that is the root of patience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which produces gentleness, mm -hmm. which results in humility. Mm -hmm. The root of all these virtues is Romans 5, 5 says that God pours His love, His self-sacrificing agape love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. Believers need to receive this love and be cognizant of developing these unifying virtues in our behavior so that we become reflectors of His love, His light, and His life in this world. That's God's ultimate plan. If we mirrored Jesus, if we reflected His love, if we understand His everlasting covenant, people from all nations will flock mm. to the light of His eternal humility. Mm. So then he goes on in verse 3, Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring. Now that's the effort, isn't it? When you endeavor to do something, that takes effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I see that my time is nearly done, but I have to read this, Colossians 3, 14 through 16. He says, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah. A lot to cover when you talk about unity and being in one. Mm -hmm. You know, when we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, let's read these passages. If you could follow them with me, if you have your Bibles. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now it says, There is one body. Think about this for a moment. Do you have to be the same to be in one body? When you study, when you study the human body, there are about 1,300 enzymes in one human cell. Mm -hmm. And each of the cells contain different enzymes, meaning thousands of types of enzymes in the human body, but each cell contains about 1,300 different enzymes. Now, what's the point? Each of these enzymes are different, but they're all in one cell. Mm -hmm. Each of us is different but we're all in one body. Yes. The Lord doesn't call us because we're just like each other. Matter of fact, the world would be very bored if it was all of me. <laughs> you know, as, as one person that got married said, if we both thought exactly the same, one of us is unnecessary. 
And so God is not calling us because we're all alike. He's call, calling us because of our diversity, unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. So let's start out by talking about the ones. There are seven ones in the New Testament that I'd like to highlight. Let's start with 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Talk about one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. One body, but many members. Mm -hmm. We also have one spirit, that is the Holy Spirit holding us together. But, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one of the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The body distributes to the cells what it needs in order for the entire body to stay together. We also have one hope, Titus 2 and verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God Amen. and Savior Jesus Christ. What is that hope? Isaiah 25 verse 9, we have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So the hope we have is in the coming of the Lord. The body, every one of the members in the body share the same hope. Then we have one faith. We contend for that faith. But Revelation 12, Revelation 14, 12 describes it this way. Here is the patience of the saints. Mm -hmm. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I'm so thankful that I don't have to make it on my own faith. I make it on the right. faith of Jesus. That's right. A tried faith, a genuine faith, a purified faith. Amen. Then we have one baptism, not sprinkling, not immersion. I mean, not, not sprinkling, not dry cleaning, not with pedals, <laughs> you know, not with a hose, but with immersion, following the example of Christ. Galatians 3:27. For as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What is that one baptism? If you're not baptized into Christ, you cannot be saved. You know, John's baptism only went but so far. They said, so far John baptizes with water, but there's one coming after that's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, what's the difference? One is to repentance, but the other one is to the transformation of a life. Yes. Jesus sees us as we are. There are many people that are baptized by water that are not transformed. Hmm. They go in yeah. wet Christian, they go in wet sinners come out, they go in dry sinners come out wet sinners. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the resurrected life, or the brand new life in Christ, we have to unite with him in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection mm -hmm. to come forth to walk in the newness of life. Mm -hmm. That's the one baptism. Then we have one God and Father. We find the Godhead on which our faith is built. John 14, verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Because up until that point, the Jews had an unmovable faith that was anchored on God alone. Mm -hmm. But there was no salvation in God alone because Jesus was to be the sacrifice. He was right. to be the lamb slain by which they would be redeemed, slain from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. The plan of salvation established long before Jesus came. Think about this for a moment. All those sacrifices performed in the Old Testament would have been to no value if Jesus was not victorious on the cross. Mm. It would have been just a bunch of dead animals, dead lambs, dead pigeons, dead goats. Mm. All that would have availed absolutely nothing. Mm. But when Jesus shed his blood, we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood as of a spotless lamb. Yes. How do we overcome? They overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And so you see this oneness brings us to the Father, to the Son, and keeps us united in the Holy Spirit. It is so sad that nowadays, even in our church, mm. there's a contention as to what place the Holy Spirit plays. Mm. Well, think about the necessity of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord talked about blasphemy, he says, the sin against the Father will be forgiven, the sin against Christ will be forgiven, but the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, not in mm. this life or in the life to come. Mm. Is that necessary? Of course. The devil wants us to, to grieve the very one by which we are saved, to grieve the very one by which we are sealed, sealed by the Holy Spirit and by promise. But that sealing cannot be done without the Lamb, Christ Jesus. So when Paul is communicating here in the book of Ephesians chapter four, he's reading verses four and five. We are one in the body, one in the spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So the question is, what is Paul communicating through this poetic description of God and the Father? The lesson points out, as Dr. McVeigh brings out, he said, by virtue of his being father of all, God is the creator. 
The rest of the sentence describes how once the world is created, God relates to all things, to everything that he made. And how does he do that? He relates to them all through his son, Christ Jesus. So Paul is revealing the spiritual architecture of the church. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which Shelley alluded to. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4, 8, 9, and 11. He says, there are diversities of gift, but the same spirit. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the same spirit, another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, another the faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit. To one and the same spirit works all these things, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Mm -hmm. That Holy Spirit. So when somebody says, I need the gift of tongues, you don't decide that. The Holy Spirit decides right. that. Mm -hmm. He gives to whomever he needs. Mm -hmm. Why would I need to speak in Spanish when everybody around me understands English? That's right. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary. So when somebody says, you need to have the gift of the Holy Spirit, you need to speak in tongues as evidence of salvation. No, the evidence of your salvation is not a gift. It's fruit. Mm -hmm. By their fruit, yeah. you'll know yeah. them. Not by their gifts. Yeah. So <laughs> consider the last seven takeaways. I think I could get it in here. Unity is the evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence. Acts 2 and verse 46, unity in the church. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Continuing daily, that was the unity of the church. That was like cell groups that we talk about today. Mm -hmm. They had that oneness house to house day by day. Then unity of the mind, Romans 12 verse 16, be of the same mind, toward one another. Do not set your minds on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. What does that mean? Does it mean that we all think the same? No, it doesn't mean we all think the same. But like all the passengers in the same plane, none of, the, none of us are alike, but we all have the same destination in mind. We are all under the same pilot's direction. We all are being attended to by the same flight attendants. <laughs> we are all on the same aircraft. God's church is very diverse, but each of us has a goal to exalt Jesus. That's what our goal should be. That's right. mm -hmm. Each of us moving in the same direction under the mm -hmm. propulsion of the Holy Spirit. That's the one mind. And we all have that love one towards another. Also the unity of peace, Ephesians 4 and verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? As far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all men. Don't wait for Shelley to be at peace with me. Right. I must be at peace with Shelley. Mm -hmm. If I want peace, I have to pursue that peace. Uh, I like a good friend of mine, uh, Donna Gann says, uh, Donna Berg now, she says, pursue peace. That means run after peace like your life depends on it and grab its ankle and refuse to let it go. <laughs> pursue peace. Then unity of the faith, Ephesians 4.13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God mm. to a perfect, that's a mature man, yes. to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the unity of the faith. But what about unity in diversity? 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 5, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Mm -hmm. Not everybody sings like Ryan. It would be boring if everybody sang like Ryan. We wouldn't be able to appreciate Ryan. <laughs> but God gives every one of us what he knows would be the gift that he can be exalted through. So don't desire Ryan's gift. Pray for God to use the gift you already have. Amen. Mm -hmm. And finally, what holds us together? Unity and service to God. Zephaniah 3 verse 9, for then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. That's what unity in the spirit is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor yeah. John. That was wonderful. We're going to make a brief announcement about a powerful resource available to you. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we continue in our study, Tuesday's lesson, Ryan Day. All right, I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson, and it's entitled, The Exalted Christ, Giver of Gifts. 
And uh, I really enjoyed this because it's focusing on verses 7 through 10. And it brings out an aspect of this that uh, a lot of people question because this is one of those texts, just a small portion of one of these texts that we're about to read that I have noticed over the years, even before I was a Seventh-day Adventist, there's many people within the Christian world that kind of twist to one of these texts to mean something that it doesn't. Well, we're going to bring clarification today as to what this text is actually saying. So I'm actually going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 7 through 10. And uh, then we're going to make some comments along the way. So starting with verse 7, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, and of course this quotes Psalm 68 verse 18, or at least a portion of it. It says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And then verse 9 says, Now this he ascended what does it mean but that he also first ascended into the lower parts of the earth? He who ascended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And uh, of course, we're going to make some comments as to what this means. But this uh, particular verse I was speaking of, verse 9 here where it says there, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Of course, many people try to tie that or pair that with 1 Peter chapter 3. And they try to say, well, you know, this is where they get that idea where Jesus, uh, you know, upon, upon, you know, his resurrection, he, or during the time that he was actually dead in the grave, uh, he went into the lower parts of the earth. He went into the deep, dark dungeons of hellfire where he preached to dead souls and to demons and, and all this. I mean, there's so many different theories out there, but this is not actually what this particular text is meaning. It doesn't mean that Jesus took a trip, you know, several miles into the, you know, deep, hot core of the, of the earth, uh, but rather it's, uh, it's actually talking about the earth and its lower regions in comparison to the higher heavens. And of course, uh, the author actually uses the New Living Translation to make this a little clearer. So I'm reading verse 9 there in the New Living Translation. It actually says, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. I like that. To our lowly world and the same who, or the same one who descended is one who ascended higher than all the heavens that he might fill the entire universe with himself. I love that. I love that. And so Christ didn't go into hell. He didn't go and preach into to dead people or demons while he was dead. Obviously, this is talking about Christ. He did ascend uh, like a war hero. And I love that. I can I just see that in, in my mind. I, I love a good, uh, you know, war hero story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, conquering evil, conquering the bad guys, but yet, you know, entering into this victorious celebration as the war hero is coming home. It's just a powerful story to, to uh, imagine. And that's exactly essentially what Christ had done. He had won the victory at the cross. He had cast Satan down once and for all at the cross. He had defeated death. He had defeated sin. He had defeated evil. He had overcome all of these things. And there was a moment upon his resurrection, he ascended to the Father. Of course, we know it had to have happened some point after he had the encounter with Mary because he said, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my Father. But then that same evening, he comes back and he was able to be touched by the disciples. Christ entered. He ascended as a war hero. And you could imagine the celebration as the Lamb of God was returning, yeah. uh, you know, with, with that blood that had been shed, having paid the price for humanity. And he received, uh, you, know, he, you know, his kingdom essentially for what he had paid for. But I, I just want to bring this out here, uh, just a note on Psalm 68 here. The lesson says, Paul here quoted Psalm 68, which reads, when you ascend to the heights, you let a crowd of captives, you receive gifts from the people, even from those who rebelled against you. Uh, Psalm 68, 18 portrays the Lord Yahweh as a conquering general. And this is the point that brings out a conquering general who having conquered his enemies ascended uh, the hill on which he uh, his capital city is built with the captives of battle in his train I love that visual it says he then receives tribute he receives the gifts from his conquered foes nothing that Paul adjusts uh, not noting that Paul adjusts the imagery to the exalted Christ giving gifts based on the wider context of Psalms uh, and of course it quotes here Psalm 68 35 but then he goes on to bring this out which I thought was powerful if we follow the order of Psalm 68, 18, which was quoted here in this verse, the ascent, Christ's ascension to the heaven, which we, of course, see there in, also in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, it occurs first. So his ascension occurs first, followed by the descent in which 
the risen, exalted Jesus gives gifts and fills all things. Mm -hmm. This is Paul's way of depicting, what is he depicting? He's depicting Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Uh, and we see that there in Acts chapter 2. This view is confirmed by Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 and 12, which identified the gifts provided by the exalted Jesus as gifts of the Spirit. And of course, you know, if you read the book of Revelation, we see this beautiful image in which, again, there's this, there's this, uh, uh, this huge problem, of course, the scrolls in the Father's hand and no one can open it, but the Lamb of God shows up. He's the only one who's worthy to receive the scroll. In fact, we read that in Revelation chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. But it's interesting that in verse 6, it says, I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. And here's the hand here, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Of course, we know the chronology of that is that the, that the Son of God did ascend. He did receive the gifts. He gives, he returns and gives the gifts by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit okay. at Pentecost. Even, uh, even uh, Mrs. White confirms this in Ye Shall Receive Power, page 158. And it says this, it says, Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When, after Christ's ascension, the Spirit came down as promised, like a rushing mighty wind, mm -hmm. filled the whole place where the disciples were assembled. Mm. What was the effect? Thousands were converted in a day. A powerful, mm. powerful view there. And of course, you see that. And I just want to confirm this also, uh, just because I know that there's a lot of people who watch Sabbath school panel. And there's a lot of people who may be not perhaps Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but of a different denomination who watch and view uh, this network. And we're so proud and so thankful to have all viewers from all different ba uh, Christian backgrounds or non-Christian backgrounds. Um, but, you know, I just want to confirm something here because one of the texts that was often quoted when I was growing up in the Pentecostal church that was kind of the foundational core text in all of the Pentecostal churches I attended was Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which is a powerful verse. It's, it's one that we should share. It's one that we should live by. But Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said to them, This all happened on the day of Pentecost. And of course, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has happened. Uh, Peter preaches this powerful sermon telling the ch children of Israel, all of those that were present, look, you murdered the Son of God. And it, the, the Bible says it pricked their hearts and they responded and said, Well, what do we do about this? Mm -hmm. Peter's response, Acts 2.38. Notice what he says. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission mission of your sins. And then notice, once you do that, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people take that and they automatically, and pastor touched on this briefly, they take that gift of the Holy Spirit and they automatically think, oh yes, all Christians, when you receive Christ and it's genuine and it's pure, many charismatic Pentecostal Christians turn that and twist that into meaning that the gift of the Holy Spirit that you will see, receive and must receive in order to have salvation is the gift of speaking in tongues. That's not what this text is talking about. This text is referring to the Holy Spirit as a gift that God will bestow upon you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you have obeyed Him. Acts chapter 5 verse 32, I believe it is, it tells yes. us that the, that the Holy Spirit is given to those whom obey Him. And so this is what this is meaning here. I don't have enough time to, to go through all of these uh, but uh, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and pastor read verse 11, he quoted verse 11, but you see there that when we, that the gifts that Christ gives us through the Holy Spirit are powerful. It's again to you unite the body of Christ. It's for the functionality and, and the carrying on of the gospel. And of course, more than anything, uh, we receive these gifts and we exercise these gifts that God gives us through the Holy Spirit for His glory. It's not mm -hmm. for our glory. It's yeah. not for us. Many times God gives us a gift. And you know what? Uh, Pastor referenced my, my singing gift. And I praise God for the gift that I have. Sometimes, you know, at my human aspect comes you know, gets the best of me. And I see someone else's gift like Pastor Loma King and Pastor Rafferty. I mean, they have such sharp biblical minds. And I think, Lord, I wish that my mind was just a little sharper. You know, I wish I had that gift of comprehension. But sometimes we often do that. We see other people's gifts and we kind of like, you know, I wish I had that. But yet we have to be happy and content with the gifts that God has given us because God has specifically given you those gifts because he trusts you with that gift. And it's not that he trusts you for, for you to use it for your own glory, right. but to use it for 
His glory. Amen. It's His gift. He's bestowing it upon you. He's giving it to you freely because He wants you to share it with others so others can be blessed, can be drawn to Jesus Christ, and through the light that people see through you by using those gifts responsibly and appropriately because He has gifted you with them through the power of His Spirit because you have been faithful, you have been genuine, you are humbled and you're following Him with all your heart, mind, and soul. He will bestow these gifts upon you and you will be free to use them for His glory. And I promise you in service for him, you will never, ever, ever be disappointed because when you use those gifts appropriately, it's the most amazing thing to see how God can transform not just your life, but other people's lives through the gifts that he gives you. Amen. 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 What a blessing. Well, I have Wednesday's lesson and it is gifts of the exalted Jesus. Here in Ephesians 4, 8, Paul says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is actually a reference to Psalm 68, 18, where David alludes to a common picture in his time. You see, whenever a king conquered a country or a nation or a city, he would come back with a host of captives and spoils, ascend onto his throne and distribute the spoils to the people in his kingdom, just as you were talking about, Brother Ryan. Mm -hmm. Jesus, the exalted king who conquered death, hell and the grave, ascended back into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit and through <coughs> the Holy Spirit, all the gifts to the church to bring the church together. Notice, that these are not just the individual gifts as set forth in 1 Corinthians 12, for example, healings and faith, as you were alluding mm -hmm. to, on the word of knowledge. Now, these are gifted leaders mm, right. that Christ has given to the church. In Ephesians 4.11, it says, He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. In other words, He gave the gift of servant yes. leadership. That's right. The purpose of these gifts was to build up the church and for the perfecting of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And the word for perfecting comes from the Greek verb kartartizo. It basically means to be restored, to be complete, to be full, mature. This is a kind of spiritual maturity, a kind of grown up spiritual character. So let's take a look at each of these groups of spiritual leaders. First, there are the apostles. And an apostle is a person sent out by God in the church to proclaim the word of God, make disciples, and establish the disciples into a church with Christ as the center. This signifies one who was sent forth from another. In fact, if we break the word down, apo means from, and stello, sent, or sent forth. So this word is one who is sent forth. An apostle is one who is sent forth from another, often with a special commission to represent another and accomplish his work. Mm -hmm. And then the term apostolos really actually refers to the 12 original apostles, mm -hmm. the disciples mm -hmm. who were chosen directly by Jesus and who actually were witnesses of his resurrection. Paul was an apostle who was taught by Jesus personally later. He wasn't a part of the original 12 disciples, but he is certainly the apostle Paul. The apostles were given authority from Christ to proclaim the gospel, and thus the apostolic teachings and writings became the foundation of the church with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Right. Some of the um, apostles, biblical apostles, examples were Peter, James, and John, and then also later, Paul, Silas, Barnabas, and Timothy. The apostles are able to adapt to different cultures, different life conditions. They're able to fit in with different groups of people. Then the second group of servant leaders are prophets. And a prophet is a person who shares what God has revealed to him or her. The New Unger's Bible Dictionary defines prophet as, quote, one who is divinely inspired to communicate God's will to his people and to disclose the future to them. In the Bible, prophets generally are those who proclaim inspired utterances on behalf of God. Some prophets are foretellers, meaning that they are predictive, and they are also forth tellers, meaning that they declare um, divinely revealed truth for the purpose of sound doctrinal instruction. Mm 
A prophet is one raised up by God and his or her charge is to proclaim only the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It is not for them to give their own opinions and say it's from the Lord. There are different tests of true prophets in the word and one of them is found in Deuteronomy 18, 22. And it says that if a prophet makes a predictive pronouncement and it doesn't come to pass, that's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. So the Bible lets us know who the true prophets are and who the false ones are. Prophets, biblical prophets are Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, Moses, and even post-biblical Ellen White. Mm -hmm. So let's compare apostles and prophets. Both apostles and prophets were foundational to the church. Ephesians 2.20 says, quote, God's household, the church, was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, end quote. The apostle gives an authoritative declaration of the whole body of truth concerning Jesus Christ, but the prophet interprets that authoritative word and explains the truth so that it becomes very clear. Right. In 1 Corinthians 14, 3, Paul says, he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding or edification and encouragement and consolation. Prophets make the truth clear, shiny, and gripping. Now, what's the difference between prophets and teachers? The prophet tends to deal more with great sweeping principles of biblical truth and reality, but the more specific areas are left to the teacher. So the prophets deal more with the larger areas. Our next group of servant leaders are the evangelists. An evangelist is someone who proclaims good news. It's a preacher of the gospel or a missionary. We have with us the, the um, director of world evangelism for 3ABN, but all of you are really evangelists and teachers and preachers and all, and it's a blessing. But the evangelist not only preaches the gospel, but they travel from place to place, sharing the gospel and calling for repentance. The purpose of evangelism is to carefully but simply help unbelievers become, una become aware of their sinfulness and lostness, if there's such a word, and through proclamation of the gospel to declare Jesus Christ as the only savior of the world. There are only three places in scripture where the word evangelist is used. That's Ephesians 4, 11, Acts 21, 8, where Philip is called an evangelist, and 2 Timothy 4, 5, where Paul exhorts his young protege to do the work of an evangelist. The evangelist has a real burden to win souls. They may sometimes get impatient if you look like you're dragging your feet about trying to win souls. <laughs> and their theme verse may be Proverbs 1130, which is the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. Amen. The evangelist deals with the beginning of Christian life. In fact, one online uh, commentator said the evangelist is like an obstetrician and the prophet and the teachers and pastors are more like pediatricians. The evangelist <laughs> helps to bring new Christians into the world and the, and the preachers and teachers help to develop them. They give them spiritual exercise and spiritual diet and that kind of thing. Our final group of servant leaders are pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers are actually joined by a conjunction in the word, a Greek word, chi, which means that is, or in particular, and some people have thought that that's just one unit, pastors and teachers, mm -hmm. but not all teachers are pastors, mm -hmm. but all pastors are teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, so we tend to think really that, that it is two separate groups. The pastor is related to shepherd. There's a Greek word, poemni, which uh, refers to a flock of sheep. The pastor is the shepherd or leader of the flock. He takes care of his sheep. Mm -hmm. Pastors can do the work of evangelists. They are to coordinate, counsel, and disciple believers. And then the teacher is one who is able to teach the basic truths of scripture with clarity and creativity. They enjoy giving Bible studies and sharing God's word in ways that are life-changing. Mm -hmm. Luke is an example of a great teacher. So finally, there are six 
reasons that the exalted Christ left us these servant leaders. One, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, in other words, to serve one another and the church. Two, to edify or build up the body of Christ. Three, to bring us all to a place of unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Four, to keep us from deception. We'll no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind and slate of doctrine. Mm -hmm. Five, to help us grow and mature in the truth. We will grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. And six, to work together in unity as the body of Christ, every part doing its share and growing and maturing into the image of God. So I ask you, are you a servant leader? Mm. What gifts has God given you? He's given gifts to all of us. Mm -hmm. What gifts do you have and how are you using them for his glory to bring us all together unto the unity of Christ? Jesus. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Yeah, I love that. I'd never seen that before, Yvonne, that emphasis on the gifts here being prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And it makes sense because the whole focus of this chapter so far has been to bring us into unity, to have the, as Shelley said, that attitude, that lowliness and meekness. And as, as John, as you were saying, that, that we need to be connected to Christ. You know, we need to be on the plane of Jesus, right? In order for us to be having the same destination and being connected together in one. That's and right. then we need the gifts. We need okay. those gifts because the Holy Spirit specifically is the one that unites us. Yes. And he works through prophets and he works through teachers and he works through pastors. And I was just thinking about this, this is really powerful because it ex specifically excludes and specifically includes certain uh, aspects of the gifts that God has given That's right. in, in these verses here. So my name is James Rafferty and I have uh, Thursday's lesson, Growing Up Into Christ. And everyone that's come before me has made this very, very easy. <laughs> Basically, how you grow up into Christ is by following everything you've just heard. And I'll add a little bit of extra here because the quarterly here goes into uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. So we're going, to, going another step here in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is what it says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine and slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Mm -hmm. Did you catch all of that? Mm -hmm. Winds of doctrine, slight and fraud of men, mm -hmm. cunning craftiness and trickery. And that, that's the same type of phrase that's used in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 where Paul warns about uh, the church receiving another gospel, another mm -hmm. Jesus, another spirit mm -hmm. and being deceived like Satan. Satan deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then another, uh, another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit is going to be something that's going to be very difficult for us unless we have good apostles and pastors and prophets and teachers because it's coming in a Christian guise. Mm -hmm. right. And so what Ephesians 4 is preparing us for is the, the worst kind of deception, the deception that can come in a Christian guise. Mm. And in order for us to withstand that, we've got to follow the, 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 the principles that have been outlined for us, have that meekness of mind, be connected to Jesus, have the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and especially appreciate the pastors and the teachers and the prophets and the words that God has given us to keep us in the unity of the faith. The quarterly says, Paul perceives an environment not like, unlike our own in which various ideas such as winds of doctrine, deceitful schemes are thrust upon upon believers, thrust upon believers. Mm -hmm. He uses these three uh, sets of images to describe the dangers of a way with theology. He, the immaturity of childhood, so they not, no longer be children. The danger of the high seas tossed to and fro by the waves mm -hmm. and carried by every wind of doctrine and being swindled by clever people like gamblers practice sleight mm -hmm. of hand, mm -hmm. right? Paul uses figuratively the Greek word kubaya, dice playing to mean cunning or trickery. So Paul believes divi divisiveness to be an important mark of error. Amen. So he's connecting divisiveness Amen. with error. That which nourishes and grows the body, helps it to hold together is good, while that which depletes and divides it is evil. Amen. So by turning from division or divisive teachings and doing that uh, and to that of tested, trusted teachers, we will advance toward true Christian maturity and play effectual roles in the body of Christ. And the most true and trusted teacher in all of the Bible is Jesus. Yes. Right. And Jesus is right. the Word. 
And it's really interesting because we've got to be careful here a little bit because when we talk about divisive teachers, we have to remember what it says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 where Jesus says, I didn't come to send peace, but I came to send a sword. I came to divide. <laughs> and we have to ask the question, you know, because Christ is the head of the body. And, you know, yet there's some division that is caused uh, by Christ or at least by his words. When we confess Christ, uh, we confess a truth that not everyone wants to receive. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of the vision, Christ says, you know, I'm going to be confessing the truth. And when I confess the truth, those who accept that truth are going to be united and those who reject that truth are going to be divided. Mm -hmm. So when we see people um, coming in the guise of, of Christianity and we see division taking place, we can almost be sure that the reason that division is taking place is because those people who are less necessarily preaching the gospel or, or perhaps you know, coming in the name of Jesus or even in the name of the Holy Spirit aren't actually teaching the words of Christ, mm. not mm. actually following the word of God. Mm. And that's where we can find a distinction. Mm. So Paul is explaining to us how we can navigate these kinds of circumstances that even Christ found himself uh, facing. So in what ways, the quarterly asked, does a healthy church function like a healthy body? And then it quotes Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Let's look at those verses. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Just got to love that King James language. It's so poetic, but you can't mm -hmm. really comprehend everything that's being said there. So let me break it down. <laughs> Paul is basically saying the first thing we want to do is speak the truth in love, right? right. And we want to grow up in Christ. We want to be mature about our relationship with Christ and then our relationship with others. And then he says, we want to join closely together in our teaching. Hey, what do you think about this thought? You know, we were on the panel earlier and I heard Shelley say to Pastor John, I'm gonna be sharing this in coming up Sabbath school. What do you think about this? Tell me if I'm wrong on this, you know? We wanna do that often, you know? Throw things out at each other and get feedback from one another. And then there's gonna be efficiency in every part because God is the one that's supplying all of the lacks, right? And we're going to be doing this to increase the body. This isn't about increasing us. This isn't about our glory. This isn't about edifying ourselves. <laughs> when we think that the gift of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, Paul says, that's because you're all about edifying yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you speak in tongues and no one understands what, it's, what it means, you're, just, you're not edifying anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. We need to edify the body. God wants to, to build and strengthen the body. And a lot of what God gives to us is not for ourselves, it's for other people. Mm -hmm. We want to edify the, edify the body, but we want to do it in love. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the quarterly goes on to say in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, Paul advocates for the unity of the church and recruits the addressees to foster it actively. While unity is a theological certainty, it does, not requ it does require our hard work. It's going to happen. There is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be part of that? because it's gonna require a little bit of self-denial, a little bit of lowliness of mind, connectivity with Christ, receiving the Holy Spirit, being taught by apostles and being taught by pastors and, and listening to the evangelist and you know getting going. It's gonna require that if we want that unity. We, we can't just sit back and say, oh yeah, we're gonna be unified. I'll, whatever they say, I'll agree with. No, a lot of people go to church and you ask them, what do they believe? Oh, I believe what our church teaches. What does your church teach? Well, our church teaches what I believe, but they don't even know what it is, right? <laughs> we need to pursue truth yes. because only the truth can unify us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Each of us is part of the body and should contribute to its health and growth. We all should also benefit from the work of the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastor teachers. These like ligaments and tendons join every joint together and they have this unifying function helping us to grow up together in Christ who is the head of the body. So there are times though we read about in, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 18 and 19, when disunity comes and God uses it. He uses heresies and the, um, the separation and divisions that come. Paul says, I, I hear there's heresies among you in 1 Corinthians 11, 18, and I partly believe it, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And then he says in 1 Timothy 2, 15, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Mm -hmm. Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, if everything else fails, God will allow heresies to come in, to wake us up, 
You ever been woken up by heresy? You're like, wait a minute, I don't think that's true. And then you go study it out. Oh, I'm gonna go study that out. And then you find yourself really getting solidified mm -hmm. in a certain truth or whatever it is that was brought up that you studied out thoroughly. Right. First heresy that I ever studied out was the idea that everyone should go to church on Saturday. That's right, Saturday. I thought, Saturday, that's not the day you should go to church. Everyone knows you go to church on Sunday. That's in the Bible. And I went to the Bible to study it out. And lo and behold, it was Saturday after all. And I got solidified in that truth Amen. through that so-called heresy, right? So Paul is saying there are, there are times when these winds of doctrine are going to be blowing and they're actually going to be good for the church because it'll cause us to go back and study and and get strong in the mm -hmm. church. The um, author, John McVeigh, asked the question, um, what kind of winds of doctrine are blowing in our church today? And I thought about that and I thought, you know, date setting for sure. I mean, that, as Adventists, that's in our blood. Mm -hmm. Ever since I've been in Adventist, oh, it's, you know, the Jubilee cycle, oh, it's Y2K, oh, it's the main calendar, oh, it's the eight popes, seven popes, eight popes, oh, you know, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's just one thing after another. And, you know, we think about the most serious ones that, that are recently developing, like the LGBTQ plus compromise that's taking place right now. And the idea that loving sinners means that we shouldn't, that we should just condone sin. And we have um, other issues that are violations of God's law, um, the principles, and then anti-Trinity emphasis, and the idea that God doesn't, you know, uh, punish, and that, you know, just it's God's, the cross is just a moral influence. And the only way we can uh, meet these heresies is to go to the Word of God. You can't go to your favorite pastor. You can't go to your favorite preacher only. Now, hopefully they're there, as it says right here, they're there to guide us in the Word of God and to help us understand the Word of God. But we need Jesus, the Word, personally, individually for ourselves. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you, James, Yvonne, Ryan, and Pastor John. What a beautiful study. We have just a moment for closing thoughts. Well, Paul in Philippians 2, verse 2 uh, encourages us. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, mm -hmm. having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Mm -hmm. May you seek that unity by Christ as the Holy Spirit leads your life. Amen. If this experience has not been your own, I want to read again Acts 2.38. It brings a beautiful promise. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord would have us to come together, and He gave us gifts of servant leaders, and He wants us to lead and, and to help others, to bring others together. And that's He's given us the Holy Spirit to do that. We just need to tap into it, take advantage of it and be blessed. Amen. I love this verse in Ephesians chapter four, but speaking the truth in love mm. may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Amen, amen and amen. Thank you each and every one. My closing thought would be that love is the root of patience. Patience produces gentleness. Gentleness produces, is, is the result of humility. And it's all based on love. So what the Bible tells us is that believers should practice these unifying virtues so that God in Christ can fill all, that we all grow up together. Join us next time for Lesson 8, Christ-Shaped Lives and Spirit-Inspired Speech. Bye-bye.